A very good day to everyone. My name is Kylie from UN Global Compact Network Malaysia and Brunei, and I will be the host for this session. It is a pleasure to have all of you here today. The invited speakers and panelists for this session are leaders in the property and construction sector across Malaysia, from design, consulting, development, and planning backgrounds. This session is part of many events held at Dubai Expo, of which the theme is Resilient Malaysia, delivering the climate agenda for global opportunities organized by Kementerian Alam Sekita dan AE, also known as CASA. The objective of this session is to explore the synergy between the public and private sectors of the property market and build environment in advancing climate action. Without further ado, please allow me to invite Dr. Som Heng Chun, who is the president of Reda Malaysia, to give a keynote on the current and proposed state of property development in Malaysia. Over to you, Dr. Som. Thank you. Thank you, Kylie. A very good day and salam sejahtera to Mr. Faros Nada, CEO of United Nations Global Compact Network Malaysia and Brunei, Mr. David Hashim, Group President of Veritas Design, esteemed panelists, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor to be invited to deliver the keynote address at this Dubai Expo webinar. Thank you to the Malaysian Pavilion Organizer, the Ministry of Environment and Water Malaysia, UNGC and Veritas for having me to say a few words about sustainability in the property market. I take this opportunity to congratulate all parties involved for organizing this timely webinar as climate action are definitely required in the real estate business. Representing the Real Estate and Housing Developers Association this afternoon, allow me to start by giving a summary update of our property market. The recently concluded radar media briefing last week revealed findings from a property industry survey gathered from about 180 member respondents, the survey which was done in September this year. The result reported that both the number of launches and sales performance went down by 8% and 6% respectively in the first half of 2021 against the previous preceding half. Citing apartments, condominiums and terrace houses in the price range of 250,000 ringgit to 500,000 ringgit as the most sought after. Increase in material and labor costs were among the main challenges to the developers, but the home ownership campaign has helped developers sustain sales during this challenging period. Despite the setback brought about by the various movement control orders in the last two years, our survey participants are hopeful of recovery in the property industry within the next six to 24 months. We are also hopeful that all the recovery plans and policy announced by the government would be implemented efficiently so that the nation will be able to move forward quickly. Ladies and gentlemen, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, many of us experienced being confined indoor and having to study and work from home. Expectation towards our own home may have also shifted. Many are more conscious that the homes and the environment we live in are naturally linked to our overall well-being. The shift in attitude due to spending more time at home has somewhat sparked the demand for change of design, functionality, and emotionally, emotional value of the home. House purchasers are now more likely to consider space-related features more than before the pandemic. Some spaces in the home are expected to be easily converted into workstation with stable broadband internet connectivity while green features such as more natural lighting and better natural ventilation are anticipated to be among the features that buyers would now look for. Similarly, design of commercial buildings are also likely to change to comply with the social distancing guidelines and better indoor air quality requirements. Globally, it has been reported that 51 billion tons of excess carbon dioxide are emitted into the environment annually, while deforestation has started since the mid 20th century. Such situation has led to acute and chronic climate events, such as the rising of sea levels, flooding, extreme storms, and forest fires. And if not attended seriously and quickly, will only lead to further damaging the ecosystem and the planet we live in. Therefore, an unprecedented global alliance is 
necessary to resolve the matter. The Paris Agreement on Climate Change in 2015, which was ratified by 196 countries at COP21, is one of the very significant initiatives undertaken to address the climate change issues. Meanwhile, the United Nations have also introduced the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, which was adopted by all UN members in 2015. It aims to protect the planet, reduce poverty, and fight inequality, and lay the foundation for a sustainable world. Ladies and gentlemen, Malaysia as a responsible nation has also taken serious steps to fight climate change. As part of the recently announced 12 Malaysia plan, we have committed to a net zero emission target by 2050. Details of the plan are yet to be released. However, a firm unconditional commitment for nationally determined contribution of 45% emission intensity reduction from 2005 levels have been pledged by Malaysia as part of the Paris Accord. Meanwhile, Bank Negara Malaysia has also released a climate change and principle-based taxonomy or CCPT document to guide financial institutions in assessing economic activities according to climate objectives. Several Malaysian banks have embarked to include ESG and climate link criteria into their requirements for both project and in financing. Busan Malaysia has also made it a mandatory requirement for sustainability reporting from all public research companies and a separate BUSA for good index, put see for good index, put benchmark and list companies that have achieved an acceptable ESG score. I therefore urge more financial institutions to join this effort of promoting ESG by offering green financing so that we can successfully achieve our green and sustainability agenda. Specific to the property industry, the Green Technology Master Plan 2017 to 2030 has set targets for incorporating low carbon cities and green building in Malaysia by 2030. The National Low Carbon Cities Master Plan or NLCCM released this year indicated that 33 cities have been selected to systematically achieve a net zero target by 2050. The Ministry of Environment and Water as the coordinating ministry will look at implementing measures across federal, state and local authority level. At present, local authorities like DBKL or KL City Hall and MPPJ are already including green building and sustainable infra criteria as part of their planning permission approval. In spite of the initiatives taken by authorities in Malaysia, more needs to be done, particularly as the nation struggles in a post-pandemic world, where COVID-19 has exacerbated the various issues that have been plaguing the property industry. A pragmatic approach needs to be taken by industry players and even the public to achieve a balance between the trilemma of economic, environmental and social sustainability. Among the key measures to be taken in support of the initiatives include the followings. Improving energy efficiencies of buildings through the use of high efficiency air conditioning units and LED lighting. Incorporating natural ventilation as this not only lowers operational costs, but also helps reduce the spread of pollutants and viruses indoors. Using cement replacement in concrete mix and recycled steel as much as possible, since these materials are responsible for close to 10% of global carbon dioxide emission. Renewable energy, especially rooftop solar solution, should be promoted widely where developers are where some developers are already incorporating them in their products. However, in view that the quota for commercial net metering is already exhausted in Malaysia, the need to be, the needs, this needs to be increased to accelerate the adoption of solar in commercial building. Implementation of waste minimization to proper coordination to 3D building information modeling of BIM during the design and implementation stage and the industrialized building system or IBS during construction. Undertake proactive measures to minimize waste to landfill and increase use of recycled content materials. Usage of low global 
warming refrigerants or GWP, as the commonly used refrigerant such as R32 has 300 times more GWP and becomes a high emission risk during disposal of air conditioning system. A recent Think City study has shown that increased temperatures over the last 20 years in five major cities in Malaysia is attributed to the urban heat island effect. Greater coordination amongst local authorities is needed, such as requirement to produce, provide more green and blue spaces in cities, encouraging green walls and roof in building, use of permeable paving material with high solar reflective index, and provision of shading for walkways in cities. Meanwhile, amongst the barriers we face towards these initiatives are the lack of awareness in embracing ESG agenda. For developers, the high input costs in adopting green features are not reflected in economic or commercial returns. Lack of government incentive to encourage the industry supply chain. Low awareness amongst house purchasers on the life cycle benefits of owning a green building or staying in the low carbon city. Thus, for developers, there is no demand pool factor. Scarcity of local green building materials, thus escalating construction costs. And the lack of green financing for ESG or green rated projects to accelerate adoption. To go green does not come without additional costs. We therefore have submitted some proposals to request for incentive from the government. As we embrace the green agenda in our budget 2022 proposal, and we look forward uh, for a favorable outcome soon. Increasingly aware of the role developers need to play to ensure sustainability and protect the environment while developing the nation, RADA has embarked upon the formation of Green RE, an initiative set up by RADA in 2013 to drive sustainability in Malaysia real estate sector. The company assessment framework is developed in collaboration with Singapore's Green Mark and is fully supported and recognized by all relevant ministries and local authorities in Malaysia. To date, Green RE has a portfolio of projects covering more than 200 million square feet in Malaysia. Green RE's building certification focuses on six pillars of sustainability when assessing a project, that is energy efficiency, water efficiency, environmental protection, indoor environmental quality, carbon footprint of development, and other green features. Apart from building certification, Green RE also offers township certification to guide planners in setting up the master plan for large scale developments, focusing on environmental planning and low carbon infrastructure. Further to this, Radar Malaysia also established ESD Green Tech in 2018, following the need for professional green building and sustainability consultancy services for real estate projects. The services offered by the company include environmentally sustainable design, green building certification, energy audit, and energy optimization. It aims to provide both tangible and intangible values to clients through design and cost optimization, operational energy, water, and resources saving, as well as industry recognition. Their total gross floor area delivered currently stands at more than 35 million square feet of green and sustainable spaces. Reda believes that these two companies will be among the drivers in our nation's 12 Malaysia plan aspiration to facilitate sustainability in the property market. We hope that all industry players will undertake more proactive actions and move together hand in hand as a united front to address this global issue. Our commitment in this effort may be the change we need for a future for all of us. Once again, I thank the organizer for inviting me to be part of this Dubai Expo 2020 webinar. It has been a pleasure to be here. I wish everyone a fruitful and enlightening session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Song, for the insightful sharing.
We will be having a panel discussion next, but before we move on to the next agenda, we will be having a short break. With this, I look forward to the next session and I'll see everyone in five minutes time. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the wait. We are now ready for the panel discussion. Please allow me to introduce the moderator, Ms. Shanta, 
who is the Associate Director of the Programs at UN Global Compact Network Malaysia and Brunei, and our panelists, Mr. David Hashim, the Group President of Veritas Design Group, Mr. Kenny Wong, Principal of Veritas Environment, Dato Dennis Ganendra, the Chief Executive Officer of Min Consult, Dato Asne American, the Group Managing Director of Saim Dhabi Property, Mr. Amajit Singh Chinna, Chief Corporate Officer of Malaysia Resources Corporation Berhad, and Dato Sulaiman bin Mohammad, the Executive Director of DBL Can DBKL Planning. Over to you, Ms. Shanta. Excellent. Thank you, Kylie. Hello, and welcome everyone to this roundtable section on climate action and the property markets. So yes, my name is Shanta. I'm the Director of Programs at UN Global Compact Network Malaysia and Brunei. It's a great pleasure and honor to be the moderator of this roundtable session as being a part of the Dubai Expo. So you may wonder why we're talking about climate action and the property markets. Well, signs of the climate crisis have been on the rise and many nations are already facing the effects of the changing weather patterns and temperatures. So in recent years, there's been an increased commitment among world leaders to achieve a net zero carbon future. And the growing momentum is as well being observed amongst the Malaysian government, investors and businesses. So during the COVID pandemic, actually the, this has further amplified the sense of urgency to tackle carbon emissions and mitigate the deepening impact of climate change. So given the critical role of the Malaysian property industry in making progress towards a low and net zero carbon economy, this round, se round table session is going to address, address this topic and discuss about climate action and the property market and exchanging the best practices and strategies which can also empower other business leaders from different industries in order to guide their organizations to adopt positive climate actions. So without further ado, I'm very uh, pleased to welcome our esteemed panelists who are industry leaders and we're very happy to be able to draw upon their expertise coming from this range of, uh, of different sectors. I will just repeat quickly who we have on the session here today. So we have Mr. David Hashim, who is the group president of the Veritas Design Group, Mr. Kenny Wong, principal of Veritas Environment, Dato Engineer Dr. Dennis Ganendra, the CEO of Min Consult, Dato Asmir Merikan, who is the managing director of Saim Darby Property Group. We have the COO of Malaysian Resources Corporation, Berhad, Mr. Amarjit Singh China. And as well, last but not least, we have Dato Salumain, who is the executive director of the DBKL planning. So as the first part of this roundtable discussion, and um, we'd like to focus on, you know, how does climate action agenda fit within the business strategy and how is it specifically relevant in the property development industry? So the first question I would like to address to Dato Dennis, if you could please provide an overview of your organization's strategy in relation to climate action. So uh, climate action is viewed under the bigger ambit of our ESG initiatives and really is implemented using a two-pronged strategy, one for our clients and projects and one for the organization itself. For the clients and projects, we launched in July 2020 the Minkton South Sustainability Mission Statement. And all projects awarded after that must fall within this framework. And what MSMS did was to analyze the 17 UN SDG goals and crystallize what was relevant for the property infrastructure and construction sector into eight supporting principles. And these were preservation and protection of the environment, minimizing wastage, adopting green technology, utilization of renewable energy, BIM, TDMS, and GIS, green modular concept, green ratings, health, safety, and well being. And these supporting principles are supported by 28 action plans. Um, all our project managers are trained to implement all these principles and offer it as a service for all Mick and South projects and clients. For the organization itself, uh, we have our Go Green initiatives and we set targets in terms of uh, waste management and recycling, energy efficiency, uh, water con con conservation, and our CHR outreach program. Going forward, um, what we're going to do is to measure our carbon footprint 
you know, by, we're going to look at analyzing our Malaysian and international activities, uh, create an inventory of emissions using established uh, GHG protocols, uh, and come up with our own corporate strategy for a net zero pledge in line with the national pledge. And once perfected for ourselves, we will share this with our local and international clients. So as you can see, a fair bit going on in the company on this matter. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Dennis. And um, so it is a very comprehensive approach that, that you have just outlined for us. So the next question I would like to ask Dr. Sulaiman and um, to explain a bit on how do organizations see the key risks and opportunities and actually how can you manage some of those climate change related risks? Okay, thank you, uh, Shanta. And thanks to everybody. Uh, good afternoon. So uh, as a capital uh, city of uh, our capital of Malaysia, we are the sanitary of uh, Paris Agreement uh, on uh, combating the climate change. We are very committed in our mission for KL to be livable, sustainable, and resilient for city for all. Kuala Lumpur, I aspire to be achieved carbon neutrality by 2050. So uh, everybody know that uh, Kuala Lumpur are not free from urban challenges. We are experienced, we experience the effect of climate change such as uh, unusual heavy rain, frequent occurrence of a flash flood, freak storm, and eminence raise of temperature. Therefore, it is absolutely necessary for Kuala Lumpur City Hall to address the climate change comprehensively. Kuala Lumpur City Hall has formulated several master plan, blueprints, and action plan in order to addressing this issue on urban climate. Indeed, these plans are important documents to regulate our planning and development in Kuala Lumpur. The Kuala Lumpur Structure Plan and the Kuala Lumpur Local Plan underpins the mission of transforming Kuala Lumpur into a city for all and especially a special chapter for environment. Kuala Lumpur also has developed our own Kuala Lumpur Low Carbon Society Blueprint, uh, Blueprint, Low Carbon Society Blueprint 2030, which the ambitious target to reduce 70% of carbon emission by 2030. Kuala Lumpur City Hall have therefore continued to develop, to build and develop Kuala Lumpur Climate Action Plan by 2050 to demonstrate our commitment to not only delivering uh, concentrate climate action, also align with the delivering of objective of our Paris Agreement. We are also undertaking the city-wide greenhouse gas inventory development to track and analyze every source of greenhouse gas emission. Together, this priority action provide firm step toward a carbon neutrality and climate resilient future for our city. It's, uh, that is our plan. We have a lot of plan that try to accommodate and uh, our action plan to combat the, the climate uh, change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dato. And it's been interesting to hear in the business strategy perspective, both from the public and in the private sector. So when we're talking about how can you actually see the key business impact, and is it important as well for businesses to align their having a kind of blueprint or aligning to the SDGs? Perhaps Dato Asmir would like to comment as well. And um, what are your comments on, on uh, from your perspective and how does Sime Darby property also incorporate this in its strategy? Hi, uh, Shanta, thank you. Thank you for the questions. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I'd like to say hello to everyone on the panel and everybody tuning in. Uh, this is a hot topic. And uh, I think, you know, discussions are you know, uh, always going to be a good kickstarter to how we're going to do better, right? So, um, you know, how do we leverage on, on, on you know, being greener uh, and, and what do we do? 
And really, there are a couple of things that we can do. Uh, I think for us, there's large, you know, two main things. Number one is to understand the impact uh, of what our business uh, and our operation uh, have on the climate. Yeah, and uh, to set a target to be more sustainable or to be uh, carbon zero, right? So that's number one. Number two, I think for companies, especially large companies, right? Uh, it's a great opportunity to be a force for good. And companies uh, need to think about this. And in this era, in the 21st century, I think stakeholder capitalism is of utmost importance, right? There's no serious company or uh, you're not going to be taken very seriously uh, if uh, people can't see what is your social purpose, right? So stakeholder capitalism, I think, is here to stay. Everybody's talking about a double or triple bottom line. Uh, and, you know, companies need to have a, a strong CSR base. So let me, let me elaborate a little bit on what I mean by, by the first point, which is to have, a, you know, uh, to understand the impact uh, of what we do. If you look at, you know, um, the way businesses operate, there's always an opportunity to do better. There's always that opportunity. So this year, earlier this year, we launched uh, our Concept Home 2030 competition. The idea is to challenge the convention, to see how do we plan, design, construct, add technology, modularity, disruption to the typical Malaysian terrace home. It's been built the same over so many years. Right? Why, why is that so? I think that's a big question that we as, as people in this industry need to think about, right? And, and the question is, you know, can we use greener materials? I, I know, um, uh, you know, can we, uh, you know, Dato' so mentioned, you know, we're generating uh, solar, uh, we, some homes can come with solar, but I also think that homes should come with batteries, right? Because what we need to do is to offset some of this and head towards energy independence. This is what we can do if we, we, we you know, we think about the, what Elon Musk has with the, uh, the power wall, right? All you need, you need to do is to offset some of this energy and you get better uh, energy independence. We can have more apps in our homes, right? To, to look at security, electricity consumption, you know, the moment you, you understand how much electricity and which appliance is consuming, uh, uh, you know, uh, electricity, you, you, you modify your behavior, right? Uh, we can look at modularity in terms of spaces because we need to use spaces needs to have multi usage, right? And of course, green construction is very very important, right? So in Malaysia, we've got another thing that we really uh, uh, love: cheap foreign labor is such an insatiable appetite. But we need to find a solution around this because it won't be here forever, right? And, uh, and I think, you know, uh, the, the industry needs to work because the cost of substitution, substitution right now is just not workable, right? So we need to work with, uh, with government, we need to work with industry, we need to have policy. How do we, how do we have, uh, how do we look at alternatives to cheap foreign labor? How does manufacturing going to make sense when the, when the alternative just, you know, is, there's no good ROI? Right. So, so the last point is really even in the design of townships, right? We need to have the township become more circular, right? At the moment, if you look at it, the demand for central infrastructure, water, electricity, sewerage, drainage, retention ponds. You know, this we are tapping, and we, we you know this costs a lot of uh, uh, you know um, usage of resources. But what we need to do is to you know, to think about even not connecting to central infrastructure. How do we make it more secular? How do we reuse our water? How do we reuse, uh, you know, sewerage? You know, we're talking about having urban farms in our township so that we can then, you know, grow vegetables and fruits and we can channel grey water. We can channel, you know, uh, uh, you know things away that, you know, it will become more secular. Right. The other thing is composting. If you live in a condo, if you if you have a composting facility, I think a lot of people would like to to contribute today, right? But we don't. So I think these are these are some of the things that we can do. I think I think there's a lot. It's good to start these discussions, 
and and I know it's, it's no better time than to, to get this going now. Yes, great, Dr. Azmir. I, I believe that you have touched upon some uh, some key actions that, uh, that we can be taken. However, when we're talking about these actions, what is really required is also modifying behavior, as you mentioned before. It is really about changing that mindset. So the stakeholder engagement in order to make this work would be very important. And um, so my next question would be to Mr. Amarjit to actually give us perhaps an understanding about how do you engage and um, with your board, how do you engage with other stakeholders and what are actually some of the key challenges uh, facing if you want to implement a climate action strategy within your organization? Thank you, Shanta. Um, I think our belief is that climate change is an existential crisis. Um, it's probably uh, the number one, um, globally, the number one risk uh, to the global economy, you know. Uh, climate risk is a financial risk. So uh, within MRCB, I think the board identified uh, climate uh, as a key enterprise risk very early on. Um, it, affects, um, it affects our whole business. You know, if we can't, uh, you're already seeing tectonic uh, shifts in the allocation of global capital um, towards more um, environmentally friendly, green, uh, uh, and, and clean energy uh, building uh, uh, companies and corporations, and um, you know, and I think moving, moving, moving further along, you're going to find it very difficult to get access to capital. Um, banks and investors are going to be uh, uh, much more stringent in where they allocate capital. So, and without capital, we don't have a business. You know, we have a relatively strong balance sheet. Um, our land bank is, is mostly unencumbered, but we require capital in order to build the buildings uh, and, and to develop those land banks. And without capital, we don't have a business. And I think increasingly you're gonna find many, many corporations realizing and waking up to the fact that, uh, you know, the, 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 this is very serious. It's not discretionary anymore. And it's something that we have to address um, very seriously. And so therefore, you know, stakeholder engagement is important. Luckily, we have major shareholders uh, and board members that are very aligned uh, to our view on this in this area and, 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 and climate in particular. Um, and what we've been doing is we've been basically uh, talking to all of our stakeholders, particularly our investors and our bankers. We've had, I mean, I've done a series of one-on-ones pretty much with all of our, all the analysts which, which follow MRCB. Uh, numerous fund managers, I've probably spoken to three or 400 people this year alone. Um, and this isn't gonna change, this isn't gonna end. We don't have to keep doing this. We have to uh, uh, report on uh, the, all the key data in relation to climate, uh, all the metrics and targets, all our action plans. Um, it's all very well having a, a net zero commitment as we do, uh, already uh, in 2040, but how are we actually going to get there? What are the pathways of getting there? You know, uh, uh, we need to flesh these out in detail, and we need to articulate these to all of our stakeholders, not just investors and bankers, um, but also to our suppliers. You know, I think the most complex thing isn't our scope one and scope two emissions, which we, you know, which are within within our control and we have a handle on. The scope three downstream. Um, is something which is going to be very complex and uh, difficult and challenging to uh, to address. We've started talking to our suppliers. Uh, we've written to our top twenty suppliers, account for about fifty percent of our uh, of, of the amounts we procure by value, and uh, we, we we're basically communicating. Um, well, we're just trying to survey them to begin with. You know, where are they on this? Have they thought about this? Do they have policies? Do they have any, any action plans? Do they measure their carbon emissions already? Um, and if they don't, you know, what, when do they propose to start thinking about it? You know, um, we want to align our own corporate plans on scope three with, uh, with, with our suppliers. And I think many are going to require a handholding. Um, there's a tremendous amount of capacity building that's required. So we don't want to shock our supply chain, you know. Uh, we want to reach out to them, we want to help them, we want to uh, point them in the right direction. Uh, UNGC is a great uh, great place to point them to. There's a lot of resources they're probably not aware of, a lot of carbon calculators that are available, and a lot of help they can get. Um, so those are just some of the, some of the things that we're doing. Excellent.
Yes, there's a wide range of stakeholders. So organizations, as, as you have pointed out, can no longer just operate and focus on sustainability in a silo. And um, so perhaps, Mr. David, would you like to and I'm comment as well, like how can you build a supporting culture in order to drive the sustainability agenda? And as well, from your perspective, what are some of your experiences and um, when implementing this and engaging with your range of stakeholders? Hmm. Well, thanks, Shanta. It's, it's great to be able to contribute uh, to this topic. And uh, unfortunately, I can't be in Dubai to be there at the expo, but I promise I will be there as soon as they lift the quarantine upon my return. I'll be one of the first to visit. But in the meantime, this will have to do. I think the question is, uh, is quite interesting. You know, the economy has a resource uh, scarcity issue, right? And the construction industry is, is no different. Um, uh, but I think the answer that we often hear are broad visionary statements, which uh, CEOs make about their, commits, about their commitments to SDG or to uh, ESGs. I think that's important. The broad visionary statements are important, but unfortunately, they're not enough. Uh, there isn't enough action on the ground, I think. Um, in, in short, I like to say in a proverbial way, there's uh, all talk and no action. Um, so I think that we have to look at how do we get action on the ground? How do we get things started? Um, especially in a context where people are scarce and you cannot afford especially uh, a small medium uh, enterprise like ourselves, we're not able to afford uh, full-time designated um, uh, ESG uh, you know, executives just who manage that. We just don't have that capacity. Maybe big multinationals or public listed companies can do that, but we don't. So the SMEs, which are the majority uh, employers in the country, uh, we don't have that kind of uh, redundancy to hire people like that. So what we have done, uh, we, they say that the necessity is the mother of invention. So instead of hiring these outside experts, what we've done is we've identified internal champions. And these are people who have a hands-on approach because they're actual designers. They're either uh, architectural designers or they're town planners or they're engineers. And we give them individual tasks. And therefore we can spread the, the workload of uh, ESG transformation not just from the top down, trying to push it, but also from um, uh, the bottom up. Uh, so for example, um, uh, here at Veritas, we have seven key areas. We call them the SWAT team, uh, you know, SWAT team, uh, special weapons and tactics. And each of them is a different aspect of ESG because none of these people are full-time in their role. They still have their nine to six job. They've, they've got to meet uh, deadlines. They've got to keep their clients happy. But in addition, they have these other rules. For example, we have the Veritas Fund for Excellence, which is our CSR initiative. Uh, Nicole Hernandez, she's one of our amazing young architects. And they do things like uh, beach cleaning and uh, mangrove uh, plant uh, uh, planting. Um, but in, in, it's interesting because when they do these things, they're not doing them as uh, an extra, extra work or extracurricular thing. We link them back to their work. For example, the, the beach cleanup and the mangrove planting, we did it in collaboration with one of her clients, which happens to own a beachfront, right? So we're bringing the work culture together with the, the sustainability culture in one. And that's uh, one uh, uh, effort called the, our, our, which is our CSR effort. The other one is our uh, CARE or conservation and responsibility to the environment. That's run by Adam, another young architect. And that's our in-house, um, uh, energy conservation and carbon footprint uh, tracking uh, entity. And, um, and this is not something Adam does because he's, it's been forced upon him. It, he does it because he's advising his clients on carbon footprint reduction. So in his real job, he's doing it and he's now bringing what he's learning to reduce the carbon footprint of our own internal organization and return the savings, the savings in energy, for example, our electricity bill savings, returning that in cash to the staff who are participating, uh, especially those who uh, take public transportation. So it's a, it's a circular um, uh, saving system. Or the other one is our Veritas lecture series. Every year we, we host a, a conference and it's run by uh, Wong Kai Yi this year. And the topic is transportation. No, it's not a burden on her because that's the area of work that she does here in, at Veritas. She's one of our 
uh, architects who works on uh, railway projects, right? So it's, a, it's, a, it's within her scope anyway to, to do that. We also have Miguel who uh, uh, is one of our lecturers on resiliency and he runs the resilient platform, the transformation that's necessary to make our buildings and cities more resilient. Uh, Kenny Wong, who you'll hear later on uh, from Veritas Environment, um, what you'll hear from him is one of the things that we're doing is uh, we have a, a work, we're working with the University of Nottingham to, uh, we built a prototype terrace house and it's filled with energy sensors and heat sensors. And we're comparing that uh, a prototype house to an average house, an un, a, a, a not well designed terrace house. And then we're gonna track the, the uh, energy and cost savings per month. Uh, so that's what we're doing. Uh, we also have Green Check, which is our in-house, um, uh, it's like a GBI or a Green Read, but it's our in-house uh, certification system. And that's run by uh, Aslina uh, because she is the one of the, the people who does certification for our projects outside. So she's created our own internal tool. So these are all things that, uh, that you know, it's, it, it's done by in-house people because we don't have the resources to hire experts. Uh, the one of the challenges, just to wrap up, is how do we bring this all together? You know, somebody says now we have to hire a full-time executive to create the uh, ESG reports that we should be doing every year. That's the next thing I'm going to scratch my head on and try to do that in the next uh, next year or so. Great, thank you, David. And um, I think that among the panelists, I've heard are the good. Um, examples of all the initiatives that are being taken by the companies and especially here um, by how can you drive that sustainability culture which is Veritas is clearly and I'm focused on. So I would like to come back a bit about how do you actually assess the key business impacts and um, previously that uh, Dennis you had mentioned to us about how your company is aligning with other frameworks such as the SDGs. So if anybody would question you know, why would I put so much resources, especially considering since I have a lack of resources on building the sustainability culture, where are I'm going to see the impacts? Dr. Dennis, would you like to comment on that? Yes, um, I think that, uh, uh, you know, you, you must move away from this thinking that uh, ESG activities don't make money, you know? Um, a lot of the time it's because we're just not aware of what is out there. So, so a lot of what we're doing is trying to make businesses aware of the facilities out there, the programs out there. Uh, actually, the government has got a lot of programs as well to, to, to encourage it. I think it could do much more, you know, um, but, but there are a lot of programs out there. So, so the, the first thing is to, 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 to move away from this thinking that ESG is a, a cost. And not an opportunity, you know. Um, but it, it is here. It's here to come. It's here to stay. I think Amajit has raised it uh, uh, very clearly that you know if you're looking to finance projects, uh, uh, you need to be able to explain this to the banks. I think the banks are taking very much a front line in pushing these principles. And 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 all of us, we need banks to help us to grow our businesses. You know. So even us. Uh, we have a number of projects, uh, not so much locally, but internationally, um, where the, the projects are stalled because these uh, uh, ESG hurdles have not been uh, crossed to meet the bank's um, uh, requirements. So we need to really, really engage in this. So it's no longer uh, a, a like to, to have, as Amajit said. It's kind of a, a must-have. But, but look at it as you know, opportunity, you know, there's a lot more opportunity to come, you know, um, there's going to be a lot of re-engineering of uh, projects, you know, how future projects, how we do things in the future. Um, and that re-engineering is not just in terms of uh, um, sort of uh, engineering, uh, mechanical engineering, but in terms of also financial engineering, how we think about and how we approach things. Um, and, and, and let's look at it as an as a opportunity rather than as a, as a hindrance. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Shanta. Thank you. Um, well, Dr. Sulaiman, earlier, and um, you had mentioned as well about the blueprint coming from the DBKL. So when you're talking to the, to the private sector about how can actually those opportunities be captured, and um, what would be some of the areas that you engage and where would you like to focus on? 
Okay, the the key challenge in uh, for achieving the urban climate action are to address and to get the buy-in and support from the stakeholder. That is the most important uh, key factor that achieve the uh, the uh, action plan or whatever uh, action that we are we going to take. So, for the general public, either from the public sector, community, business entity, private sector should give their support to this agenda. That is uh, what I mentioned before that Kuala Lumpur has uh, completed our low carbon society blueprint that we have 245 programs that uh, that been uh, lined up for us to achieve our 7030 uh, reduction of uh, carbon emission. So what that uh, Kuala Lumpur City Hall uh, is doing now is to carry out many awareness campaign and uh, capacity building among our officer uh, stakeholders to understand and the importance of modeling uh, inventory, model, model inventory, a problem related uh, to the uh, climate action, uh, ac climate uh, changes, or uh, global warming also. So what uh, we plan now is uh, we try to get our new target uh, in 2050 to become our Kuala Lumpur as a carbon neutral in 2050. So our most challenge is to ensure that everybody in Kuala Lumpur from the uh, community to the business sector, to the uh, uh, industry, building industry, uh, support us on achieving the carbon neutral. That is, that is our challenge now. Thank you. Excellent. And um, my next question will be to Kenny of Veritas Environment, because as we previously heard that target setting is very important in order to achieve the climate agenda and its goals accordingly. So, how would you recommend as well? What's important for businesses to start with uh, target setting and how can they make measurable progress? Uh, in order for businesses to make target setting, first of all, they need to be realistic in terms of the achievement that they're planning to, to, to achieve. Okay, uh, Let's talk about in terms of uh, SDG and ESG, like what the 12th population plan have already announced, where these two uh, will be given a primary focus as the main objective in achieving the government's target. So for, for a target setting of a company, they have to be realistic in terms of their budgetary, in terms of uh, how are they going to achieve in terms of the ratings in, on, on, on getting ASG as part of the BUSA's uh, uh, latest requirement? Okay, So all comes back to uh, in terms of uh, uh, the cap their capability in terms of budgetary, in terms of uh, their, the technical capability uh, and also the properties that they own. So they need to set a realistic target, like for example, okay, further down the road, maybe five to 10 years, okay. Uh, what are the achievements that they really need to uh, take a look in terms of a uh, targeted rating for ESG? If let's say they're, they're, re they're going for a very high target, then of course the additional investment costs uh, has to be there and they need to be realistic in terms of budgetary. So that's what, uh, that's what they might, they, they can actually look into that. And, you know, in terms of, uh, Target focus itself, I, I think it's very important for them to to be realistic, to be uh, to achieve uh, whatever that they think that can uh, the further down the road, and also it comes and it ties in with you know all the green uh, green sustainable economic uh, sectors that we have, and by doing so, uh, they also need to bring in uh, in terms of uh, the experts that they can help them. And also to make use of the government's incentive that has been rolled out down the 12th nation plan. Like, for example, we talk about the carbon tax, which is in the pipeline. So uh, this is actually a really uh, good shot in the arm in terms of the green uh, economic social sector, because, you know, this is the first time that carbon tax has been introduced in Malaysia. And, you know, uh, previously before that, we have a really uh, encouraging response from the public in terms of, uh, you know, uh, having green tax incentive and to certify all the green buildings. So that is something that uh, a lot of big companies can actually uh, target and take a look on. And also uh, 
when we when we look into this kind of trends, you know, uh, it, we have to be realistic because multinational companies are the ones that are moving into this direction, and we need more of these kind of companies which have vision for the future. And in terms of our local companies, I would say that yes, it's indeed a bit of a setback because we 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 haven't really got that you know uh, advanced uh, 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 capability in terms of budgetary, in terms of vision. But I I I do really hope that with this twelve Malaysian plan uh, being uh, laid down the road, uh, it will really help and boost the green economic sector and also to help companies uh, to set a realistic target in terms of the kind of ratings that they can achieve for that. Yeah. Thanks, Shanta. Right. Thank you, Kenny. So, and um, when we're talking about actually how can you balance and, um, the economic considerations together with environmental factors, I'd like to address the next question to Dato Asmir. So from Sam Darby Properties perspective as well, how do you actually balance and, um, those key investment considerations from your perspective? Yeah, that's a that's a good question, and you know, uh, I, I think you know, uh, I think that to, uh, Dennis mentioned right. It's a there's a cost to this. Uh, I I believe that we are at a place where it is currently a cost, right, and where we need to go with more green uh, initiatives and and substitution as we will get to parity. And there will come a time when parity will actually uh, even improve that green solutions will be cheaper. This is where it's going to go. The way we're challenging things in sign up property is that you just can't have a substitute which is going to cost you more money, right? You've got to find a solution that is better, but also saves you money. And this is the challenge that we've given people. How do we do this? Now, I, I, I don't... Uh, you know, uh, you know, profess that this is not going to be something easy, right? So this is, this this is something that is going to be hard to do. But this is the right direction for us to go, right? Number two, I think we need to go towards neutrality, and we need to set a date. When are we going to do this, right? And we got to be clever doing this because it does impact current cost structure, right? But I think as any company, we've got to make a decision when are we going to do this. So we, we are looking at this. In fact, management has come up with a date, uh, but we've got to prove it that you know, we can do it and it has to be auditable. You, you, know, it's, you, know, you've, you know, you can't greenwash this stuff, you know, and you've, you've got to be able to prove it scientifically. So there's two things uh, that we need to look at. Number one is operational carbon. Right. We know our data, we know that you know, we've got, if, you know, if we, 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 how much do we uh, pollute each year, you know, and you know, we gen generally, you know, for us 36,000 tons a year times 48 years in operations, there's a couple of million uh, tons of carbon out there, which has never been sequestered, right? So what are we going to do about it? So that's actually a simpler a simpler problem to solve. The second and more complex problem is embodied carbon. That's carbon along the entire value chain, right? That's something that is more complex. We are starting to understand this. And mind you, right, I have, I have a, a you know, not, not large, but a, a significant sustainability department here, right? That looks into all this and analyzes this. And they're dedicated people that tells me this stuff and they're trying to get better and better, right? And, and this is not easy. And Malaysian companies are learning how, how to deal with this. So what we need to do, I think, uh, you know, uh, you, you look back what uh, Dr. Soam said in his speech, that the whole industry has got to, got to go and, and, and think about what we're going to do. What we need, in fact, to do better is to get clearer direction and policy. Once industry understands you know, what is the direction, what's the policy, we can mobilize. We can understand where we are going to get our, going to put our money and how we're going to recover our investments. So that comes from having clearer policy, right? And then we, we are able to implement. So we are a business, we have to make money. Um, but if you, I mean, to drive and to, to be a catalyst, I think we need to set that direction. So I'm excited to hear about Malaysia going uh, carbon neutral by 2050. I think what will come next is clearer policies, guidelines, and it will trickle down to industry. 
And when it comes down to industry, I think that's the exciting part where we all of us can work together and see how do we get there sooner than later. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Asmir. So as you mentioned, like the direction in policy, which will then also be the direction in bis that businesses are going to take will be very important and, um, to achieve climate action goals. And, um, and you have mentioned as well that, you know, the data and Mr. Amarjit had also mentioned about how data and reporting is an, um, important in order to inform and engage with your stakeholders and also and, um, to perhaps measure. So Mr. Amarjit, would you like to and, um, comment on the perspective from MRCB? Like what is the data, is data, how do you collect your data? Where, where are the starting points? Is this helping you to make your decisions on where the direction of the company is going? Yeah. Um... I mean, we've been collecting data on our carbon emissions and our carbon intensity um, for two years now. Um, and we have obviously um, annual targets in place. What we're trying to do is move, move on to a science-based uh, target regime. We haven't uh, so far, but we intend to, because obviously you, it's important that we have um, our emission reduction targets anchored on something. Obviously, Malaysia, uh, according to the Paris Accord, has to reduce its uh, uh, carbon emissions by 45% uh, inten uh, carbon intensity um, uh, to reach its national goals. So uh, it's important that we play our role and we anchor our um, reduction targets onto that national uh, objective and national target. Um, but, you know, this is, this. I mean, I think scope one and scope two carbon emissions are relatively straightforward to address because they're, they're they're, they're under your control. Remember, we're in an, a very carbon intensive sector. You know, the World Economic Forum uh, forecasts that the property and construction sector accounts for 40% of global carbon emissions. Okay, we're a primary sector. You know, I think one of the biggest culprits is cement. Um, and, you know, I read over the weekend, I think it was in the Financial Times, that if you if you, if, if you treat the cement, the, the global cement industry as a country, it ranks third in terms of global carbon emissions. China's number one, the United States is number two, the cement industry is number three. So yes, whilst we can do a lot, as Dato Azmir said, in terms of our own businesses, and we have to think out of the box, and we have to innovate and come up with solutions and new technologies, uh, there's a trade-off in that. Um, definitely, I think it's a fallacy that uh, investors are chasing these companies that are, you know, uh, coming up with um, uh, addressing this because valuations are very high and there's going to be a financial trade-off. It's going to take a long time to, to earn the returns required uh, to justify the valuations of these share prices, which is quite ridiculous. Companies can't pivot away um, uh, uh, so easily. The oil and gas industry is not going to be able to pivot. Uh, if it does, it'll be a disaster for the world. If you look at the energy requirements in the next 20 years, we need three times the energy requirement, energy that we that we use today. So you, you can't get rid of fossil fuels. Fossil fuels will have, to, will have to find a place whilst we come up with new clean and renewable energy uh, sources. So I think there's a lot of... Um, a lot of clarification, misinformation that we have to correct and education, you know. Um, but I think we, you know, that it's almost, if you look at cement, for example, it always requires a national or a multi multilateral approach. You know, how do you address this? It's such a key uh, material in our industry, you know. Um, how, how, how do we substitute uh, that um, uh, moving forward, you know, so a lot of our, a lot of the challenges are going to be in that scope through, and that's going to, going to be our downstream supply chain, you know, and our supply chain is enormous. It's one of the reasons why the construction sector is used by governments to uh, pump prime economies because it's such a such a wide supply chain that can act as a catalyst and a multiplier to the overall economy. So there's a lot to do and it's going to be very very challenging we're just scratching the surface at the moment uh, we need technological developments to keep pace with um, uh, demands by stakeholders and investors and the and 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 the people at large you know um, it's going to be very very difficult so yes we have uh, we collect data 
uh, and um, you know that that's not easy for our industry, for our business. It's not e easy. We don't have a, a, a finite we don't have a finite ring fence plant or an office, and that's it. You know, we have construction sites littered all over the place. We have new sites, we have old sites to drop off. You know, so and the biggest thing is going to be the supply chain. You know, we we have an international supply chain as well. How do we audit all of our supplies internationally? It's going to take many, many years to do that. And that, that's where the biggest impact is going to come from. It's not going to come from our scope one and scope two, uh, because that's relatively small in the overall scheme of things. It's going to be scope three. And that requires wholesale changes in the way we think and, uh, and, and coming up with some very radical, uh, impactful solutions. I'm, so, I'm sorry to be, you know, uh, sorry to be a bit of a downer on this, but I'm just being realistic, I think. And the oh, panelists yeah. may disagree. <laughs> well, I won't uh, disagree with you. There, there are huge challenges ahead. And um, I do believe, especially the construction industry, given its big impact, and then um, will be heavily scrutinized as well on what are the changes and what is the action plan that they will do in order to mitigate all of this climate risk. So actually, especially seeing as you know, property and construction has such a visible and tangible representation. And um, David, perhaps could you see, could you advise and give your comments on how property companies can prevent the greenwashing label? And um, because with its visibility and which is known an um, impact uh, on climate change, how, what there's a very fine line. So would you like to comment on that? Well, first, I want to say that uh, Amarjit is not an optimist or a pessimist. I've always known him as a realist. So uh, whatever that says about the situation, you can take it uh, or on its own merits. You know, I think, um, you know, that, Dr. Asmir talked about the importance of policy. And I do agree that policy is important. But I also think that equally important is the market and, um, and how we can uh, stimulate self-interest of the market to uh, drive uh, uh, the response to climate change. And what I mean by that is I think if we have the right information, the right data, the right tools, I think we can educate the uh, public, meaning our, the buyers of our products in the construction industry, apartments, houses, hotels, shopping malls, whatever, to, con to educate them that uh, we, we're not trying to make them altruistic. We don't be going to depend on their altruism to save the world. That, that won't work. That will not motivate people, okay? Unfortunately, we found that out over the recent 18 months, that no matter how dire a situation you can paint for people, they will not go out of their way, even to save themselves by putting on a, a mask, right? So we're not gonna be able to rely on sense of um, altruism or the what's, good, what's the greater good. But if we have data, tools, and the right information, we can convince them that doing what's right is also good for their pocket. And what I mean is the kind of work that we do uh, a lot of and, and the work that Kenny and I work on, which is that every building that we design, we have many different uh, options, many different models of understanding if with this extra capital cost, with an extra 1% capital cost, you can recover your energy savings within say two years. With an extra 4% capital cost, you can recover your additional capital within say four years. And after that, it's, it's, it's savings uh, after that. So if, if uh, you know, I know that Dato Azmir is doing this uh, Slime Darby uh, terrace housing competition. This is exactly the kind of exercises that need to be done. Uh, buildings need to be self-evident in their design. There's a lot of greenwashing out there. Uh, a lot of the products are shown to be, are, are stated to be green. Actually, all they have is some green things on them like plants and all that. It reminds me of the time I went to a shopping mall uh, with my, uh, my electric vehicle and I was looking for the, uh, where I could charge the, my, uh, my car and I was shown direction that around the corner there's a, a parking for green cars. I finally got there and sure enough, there was a green paradua there. And, and, and that's basically the problem with our education system, right? So, but if we can uh, have you know, engineers uh, think about ways to reduce energy, then we're going to convince people to do, to do the right thing, not because it's the right thing, but also because it's going to uh, save them money. And if we can educate them, if we have the data, we have the facts, we can market, we can market to them these facts. I think developers will have a, a, a better chance 
to do better buildings and make money as well. Okay, great. So yeah, I, what I get from this as well is that technology and then will play also an important role in how to facilitate and um, those uh, those outcomes. So perhaps Kenny, could you comment on like what is the role uh, of technology uh, within this? And do you think that you know as well from the business perspective, do businesses need to be more educated on how can they use technology to their advantage? Definitely, thanks, Shanta. Technology definitely changes the world, right? Okay, as, uh, as what I've always mentioned, you know, sustainability is actually investment for the future. So without investment in all these high technology uh, available uh, machineries and equipments that help us to, you know, make our life much more efficient, definitely we can't be able to go for carbon neutral or carbon zero. You know, without all these uh, latest technology on solar panels that uh, is available in the market, we, we can't really, uh, you know, uh, decarbonize our uh, energy usage. So that's the thing. And even when we talk about chillers, uh, for example, 10 years back chillers, well, well, it's actually very expensive, but uh, the technology itself is not very efficient compared to the latest available chillers in the market. So. That's, that's what we always put into uh, to, towards developers. You see, if let's say you invest into this advanced technology uh, chillers uh, with this X amount, your return of investment is within four to five years. But that building itself is going to stand for at least 30 years. So try to imagine the impact itself. After three to four years, the whole entire system is actually savings to you, right? So... And of course, savings actually equals to environmental protection because you use lesser energy. Uh, and that means your building itself is producing lesser carbon footprint. So that is one way we decarbonize uh, our city, which is in line to uh, what Malaysian plan is, where they did mention that with that total X amount of buildings in Malaysia, we are trying to retrofit with all the latest technology that we have well, I mean, in terms of certification, sometimes I would always put it as it's just on paper, but we need to do things that are right at there for the first place. So that's where technology actually brings us in, you know, in terms of we, we looking at 10 years back in terms of glazing itself, the performance might not be that great, but compared to the latest available technology, uh, maybe it's from German or maybe it's from China, the glazing itself is actually magnificent. And the cost itself is actually much more cheaper compared to 10 years back. So it's actually a no-brainer. That's why I always mention to clients, you know, to uh, developer friends, you know, sustainability is actually investment for future. It's something that we need to do. And it's part of our responsibility, you know, as a developer, as a contractor, as a consultant, as an architect, and as an engineer. So technology really brings us together. And of course, without that, we can't really achieve that. Uh, carbon footprint that we already set the target and trying to decarbonize our nation. So without all those latest technology that is available in the market, it's going to be a tall order for us. Yeah. So that's why investment for the future is equals to sustainability. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Kenny. So when we're talking about, we can jump in there, uh, Shanta. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm intrigued by, by, by what Kenny said, but I also want to say that I'm, I'm more optimistic than pessimistic uh, because I look around, and especially at the property development uh, uh, industry, right? There's so many things that we're doing and we know that we're doing, not doing a good job, right? There's so many things that we can do better. And the from design, I mean, I'm not, I'm not an engineer like Dr. Dennis, you know, I, 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 or, or, or no, an architect, but I, I look at things, you know, quite, you know, Freshly, I suppose. Uh, we, I mean, the whole team knows we can, we can, we can do so much better. Uh, we, we, we now, we, you know, things have kind of bubbled up now that we, you know, we really want to get things done. And and if you know, just design of the township, we can see that we can do better. Uh, we're not talking about green cement. And 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 you know, as I say, you you ask and you demand and you will receive. Somebody is going to go and figure out how to make green cement cheaper. Right, somebody's. There are people out there. You put up the biggest problem in the world. People will solve it. So I think I'm. I'm very optimistic in the way that you know we can solve it faster and better. We will surprise ourselves. 
That's number one. Number two, I think Kenny, I maybe mean, because we have Datuk Sulaiman here, right? I don't get a chance to see him all the time. So, you know, one of the things that we see, you know, one of the fastest way you can turn around and get buildings to become greener is to, to rate them and let them display their rating in front of their buildings as you walk in. And, you know, if you get a tax incentive, great. So maybe Datuk Sulaiman, you, you know, you want to have a five-star building or a two-star building in Kuala Lumpur and, you know, do, you know, no building owner wants to be a two-star building. They'll be forced to change their <laughs> <laughs> so, so, There's a lot of things we can do. So I, I think that is a good, uh, good uh, what you call it, suggestion to us that uh, every building needs to be put, uh, put their, their certification in front of the the building that is, that is good. Lobby, you see that, yeah. we we try to introduce the uh, what we call it uh, uh, dry construction which yes. in accordance to the uh, 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 what we call it uh, the IDS so yeah. with this then you can you can go for the green building so then as you say maybe we can put the certification in front of their building a big uh, signage so everybody don't want to be a uh, low rated, of course they want to be the high rated, uh, high rated building. Uh, thanks for the for the suggestion. <laughs> we will look into that. Thank you, thank you. It's it's called the name and shame process. Uh, can I just also add? I, I, mean, I agree with Dato Azmir. Um, I think, I think you know we're talking about the risks, but obviously there are huge opportunities out there you know and if somebody does come up with these solutions there's a lot of money to be made and and capitalism is always a is always a very good incentive uh for for creating solutions um and also i agree with what he's saying about a lot of the issues that the industry has i mean you know like our dependence on foreign workers i mean you know why to this day are we so dependent that's just laziness i think you know uh it's an unsustainable crutch that the industry has uh, it's been very exposed by COVID over the last couple of years. Uh, and moving forward, it's going to become increasingly uh, unsustainable. It creates a lot of problems for the industry, um, a lot of waste, a um, lot of um, uh, uh, poor quality construction because the mm -hmm. foreign workers we use are very low quality, are very unskilled. Um, and it's a, it's a financial drain, you know? So again, you know, we need to deal with very fundamental problems that the industry has. Um, and you know we are. I mean, we, I mean we, we've come up with a modular modular construction technology, uh, which uh, uh, we've we've patented, which we believe uh, will you know reduces uh, a, a lot of waste, a lot of energy consumption, uh, and a lot of our dependence on foreign workers. And we, can, and we, get, and we the reason why we have foreign workers is because obviously construction is a three D industry, dirty, dangerous, and difficult, and a local uh, population doesn't want to. Um, enter into it but if you change that and change your perception make it safer um, make it so that uh, work isn't undertaken on site it's, it's undertaken off site in controlled safe environment there's no reason why local the lo local Malaysians won't uh, enter that and uh, look for careers in that industry you know and you know that technology is aligned to five different UN SDGs uh, it's much faster you can construct a high-rise building uh, in, in half the time it normally does using traditional construction. And um, it's, it saves a lot of money, which you can pass on to the consumer. Um, and, you know, and as I said, a lot of, lot of diverse, a lot of waste, which goes to landfills, landfills, which we're running out of, which are becoming end of life, which generate a lot of methane, uh, which is 72 times worse than carbon dioxide in terms of uh, um, uh, warming, warming the planet. You know, so there are solutions, and um, mm. you know, I think I think I, I agree with Dr. Azamir completely. You know, and that's what we what we need to do. I mean, obviously, there are bigger bigger issues that we need to deal with globally as an industry. You know, given given you know, we do create so much uh, uh, carbon intensity uh, 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 globally. You know, but yeah, I mean, I think there are pockets of innovation which are going to help us get there. You know, and and I think people will do very well um, financially. Um, as a result of uh, innovating those. One of the areas of innovation, Amarjit, since you mentioned concrete contributing so much to global climate change, and I've been reading about um, uh, a new um, art research and development in different forms of concrete. See, currently concrete uses aggregate, which is you know blasted out of limestone hills, right? But the future will be recycled aggregate, which means that old buildings can be crushed 
the concrete and the brick can be crushed to form a, a recycled aggregate. Um, I don't know why we do still cut down limestone hills today. It's absolutely unnecessary, except there isn't a ecosystem ready to uh, pound the aggregate into gravel to be, to be built into new buildings. Similarly for the steel that goes into reinforced mm -hmm. concrete, all the steel that goes into reinforced concrete tends to come from steel mills, which is creating almost new steel. But yet there's so much uh, rust, rust, rusting and uh, rotting steel out there, which there just isn't a, um, a value chain, a supply chain rather, to collect it, recycle it, and put it back into new buildings. Uh, but the, the last point I'd like to make before Shanta kicks me out is, um, I mean, good news is if you look at global population growth, uh, most uh, analysts feel that we've passed the point of the highest growth rates, that we are now going into an era of moderate growth rates and eventually plateauing uh, rates, uh, that the only last continent to actually be growing population may be Africa. But the rest of the world uh, by the year 2050 will have stagnated in growth. In fact, some countries, as you know, are reducing in growth. And if there's any hope, if there's any hope for a sustainable future, it's uh, where population growth uh, starts to average out, even if we start using more energy per person, per capita. Okay, back to you, Shanta, sorry. <laughs> it's a great discussion amongst uh, the panelists. Um, so as we are entering now, it's the last uh, 15 minutes of our discussion. I would actually like to take this timing for all the panelists um, to give a brief start. What are the starting points when you are starting to enable climate action within your organization? Because during the past hour, we have heard a lot of different examples, the challenges, the opportunities. But for you, what could be and what could your advice be to the business leaders out there who are listening to this? What would be some of those starting points? Uh, Dr. Dennis, perhaps you would like to start. Um, I think that, uh, you know, um, let's, look, let's look at the national agenda. You know, if I can, if I can focus on that, you know, um, because when you look at the national agenda, then, then uh, it rolls out to the businesses. Um, I think that you know, nationally, we can do much more in terms of, uh, what do you call it, um, the green agenda. There's a lot of talk about uh, carbon tax, but before we implement the carbon tax, there's a lot that you know, we can do as a nation. You know? So uh, as an example, um, one of the big issues that, that we, we have is that you know, renewable energy in the country is uh, funded by a set that's collected from the consumers and an amount paid by TNB. So wh whatever green power is paid by co contribution from this consumer set as well as TNB uh, payment. Now TNB actually pays less for green energy than it does for dirty hydrocarbon energy. So to us, this is illogical and unfair. And if you can get TNB to pay a higher displaced cost, then that assess, which is collected from the public, can go much further and develop much more um, uh, RE projects for the country. You know? um, similarly, uh, there's a lot of antiquated rules at the moment, um, which are hindering uh, implementation of RE projects. You know? So some of these are like engineering rules, things like uh, reverse energy flows. These are antiquated sort of uh, conventions which have no real engineering basis. You know, if you can get rid of these rules, and it costs nothing to do that, and, and there's no engineering basis for these rules, we can implement much more RE projects uh, in, the, in the country. You know, uh, in, in addition to these antiquated engineering rules, there's these uh, uh, sort of illogical corporate rules. You know, the government is so um, restrictive in terms of how RE players can um, tr uh, sell and buy companies, you know, we should have a vibrant, uh, exciting RE industry community uh, in the in the uh, what you call it um, in the country, um, you know, which can which which should, which should uh, be governed by market forces. So having all this government intervention is actually slowing growth down. So if if government can unlock this. You know, I think there'll be a lot, a lot of opportunities uh, uh, for businesses like, like all of ours to um, 
uh, to grow in the green sector. Um, um, but um, there's a lot of talk also about uh, uh, carbon pricing and all that. So if I can touch a little bit, touch a little bit about that as well, you know, um, because um, uh, for me, there's there's uh, once you cover all these low hanging fruits, carbon pricing uh, is quite inevitable. Um, the uh, uh, but for me, I got I got really five pointers in terms of uh, carbon pricing. I think first thing is the thing that Amajit touched on, um, which is really that uh, the government really needs to support the adoption of carbon accounting amongst companies. You know, so how can we really talk about carbon pricing when the firms really don't understand their carbon footprint? You know, um, the next thing was also something that Dr. Azmi talked about, which is really clear signaling. You know. Don't spook us, don't spook the industry, really sudden off the hip announcements, you know. Give us, you know, some long-term commitments, give us timelines, a stepwise process, uh, make it very uh, a transparent process, uh, and really engage the industry. And, and here, when I say engage the industry, don't just have the big players like Gato Azmir and Amajit, you know, those Sam Darby's and MRCDs, you know. And you know, get the smart guys like, you know, David, smart team, uh, get the, the, the more enlightened uh, government uh, servants like you know, Dr. Suleiman and the great work is done in there and really engage uh, 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 the industry when you implement this. Um, the next thing is don't go straight into it without doing a pilot. You know, uh, if you look at how it was done in China, um, they, didn't, uh, they didn't do it straight away everywhere. You know, they selected uh, six provinces and then implemented uh, carbon pricing amongst the six provinces before rolling it out uh, uh, nationwide. So let's, let's do a pilot first and don't jump, jump uh, head in. And, and again, when they rolled it out, they didn't roll it out for everyone. You know, they started off with really just the um, uh, power industry, and then they'll slowly roll it out to others. And, and um, the next thing is, you, know, you want to do a carbon tax to really please make sure the money doesn't go into the central pool and do other stuff, you know, you must go into a separated pool and, and, and really be focused on the green agenda. And, and lastly, if you really want to introduce a successful green uh, carbon policy, a carbon tax policy, you need to look at the cross-border issues, you know. So you can't have uh, leakages through um, uh, imports from other countries. You don't have such a policy. So, so I'm very excited by, by all these pledges. I think there's a lot of opportunities for companies uh, uh, to, to get involved in it, but we really need a clear roadmap from the government. Thank you. Okay, great. Dr. Dennis, I think that you've provided a very nice bridge for me now to hand over to Dr. Suleiman uh, to please comment on, uh, on the discussions and also for you, what will be some of the starting points? Okay, thank you. Uh, as a development, uh, de develop, development re regulator in Kuala Lumpur, of course, we, we try to work closely with all the uh, uh, property development industry and all the developers to help us in achieving this uh, carbon emission by imposing few conditions in development order for their development project. Of course, uh, what <clears throat> we are encouraging all the developer to build a green building Whatever it is, it still uh, need to be uh, accredited as a, a green building. Provide uh, a pedestrian walkway to link between the buildings so that uh, we, will, we will walk through the building, not use our uh, motor vehicle. And then uh, provide shuttle service and to the transit station to support our mobility. And then the, the latest or the newest that uh, we impose in our planning condition is at least every building need to provide 30% from the possible renewable energy into their building. That is the, the latest one that, that uh, we, we, we impose. Of course, other than that is imposing the rainwater harvesting system in their building and others. others some sort of like that. So we are, we are <clears throat> encourage all the stakeholders to be with us and uh, 
and make sure that uh, to ensure that the uh, low carbon uh, blueprint is is achievable. That's about all. Thank you. Thank you, Dato. Um, then now I would like to give to Dato Asmir. What, uh, from your perspective, what will be some of the starting points? So I think there's some uh, really great points made. Uh, I, I think those, those really make sense. I think what I could add is that the fact that, you know, if you want to start, you know, uh, for a company, uh, we've got to align uh, ourselves uh, internally, uh, board, management, and everybody. I think everybody's got to uh, uh, be, uh, you know, uh, a little bit more uh, visionary in the fact that, you know, we, we do have a big challenge and we can get there together. Uh, so in, in, in what we, we're doing is you know setting our own target. Um, our board has challenged us to you know to you know uh, look at look at it and, and prove it scientifically uh, before we make an announcement. So we're doing that. But internally, we we, you know, we, we are excited the fact that you know we we have a, a an aggressive target, and we're going to work backwards to see how do we how do we how do we you know uh, you know uh, change. Our operations, uh, understand the cost implications, look at substitute. So there's a lot of work, a tremendous amount of work. Um, but that's our starting point. Great. Amarjit, what would be your uh, words of advice and where can business leaders start? Just start. <laughs> that's my advice. Uh, small steps, you know, don't be too ambitious, just start. Um, I think a lot of people have a fear of the unknown. Um, I think um, we, do, we, we, do, we do ourselves a disservice by, we have a lot of jargon, uh, which complicates things, or makes things sound very complicated, but actually it's very simple, you know. I think once you get into it, you'll find it's very simple, especially in a scope one and scope two, um, uh, uh, get, establishing a baseline for scope one and scope two. I mean, scope one is basically just your... Uh, your company cars, probably your vehicles, your pet, your direct fuel cost. Scope two is your Tanaga bills, your energy bills. You know, uh, you have calculators you can get to, to, to help you um, assess what your emissions are. You know, um, and just start measuring. That's all. And then um, I think also I agree with Dr. again that I think it needs to be a, a cultural approach. I think you need to align your organization, everybody from the CEO down to the tea lady has a role to play in this, need to understand what it's about, why, they, why we're doing it. I think a lot of people um, probably don't understand the SDGs actually even, you know, and, and just simply explaining what they, what they mean and, and uh, what their purpose is, is important. I think a lot of tools available, like, as I said, UNGC has a number of tools. You have a great academy with some amazing online e-learning, uh, uh, courses which we utilize uh, across our organization they're very short uh, to the point you know 30 minutes and you know we've made it mandatory for staff to to to, to take those uh, and you know we, you know it's just messaging communicating and aligning and I said it's 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 behavioral change it's cultural change you know otherwise I think you're just going through the motions and box ticking if you don't do that you know, uh, the TDAD needs to understand why she needs to switch off the kettle when she, on a Friday evening before the weekend, you know, you know, simple things like that. The drivers need to know, you know, about uh, driving um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way which doesn't uh, um, consume too much petrol. And, you know, so it, it, down to that sort of level as well, if you get down to that level, you know, you're going to you're going to you're going to succeed because everybody's going to understand what it's about and they're all going to be aligned and they're going to come up with ideas themselves. You know, and I think that's what that's what uh, uh, we found, and I think um, that's what will help us, you know, get to where we get to. It's, it's a it's a journey. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So, but just start. Excellent. We have one minute left, which I would like to give to David to give his uh, final advices as well, especially seeing your great experience in driving sustainability <laughs> culture. So, what would be your advice? Well, you know, we can we can wait for policies to change, right? I mean, we can we can fight for that and we can argue for that. And, and that's very important because at that level, that's very critical. Um, uh, as leaders, and all of us here are leaders, we could also be pushing these things from the top down. We could be forcing our staff to do these things because we think it's right. And that frankly, I have had the most fun and the most success with a bottom up approach. Kind of like what Amajit said, which is you, you paint the big picture of what the challenges are. You paint the big picture of what the opportunities are. And then you know what? 
You let the young people come up with the ideas. In fact, many of the projects that we're on now, like I mentioned the mangrove planting or the, the um, we're now putting a, a green roof or planting vegetables on the roof of our building. These were not my ideas. These were not my ideas. They all came from the bottom, from the younger staff who have learned what is it, what we need to do. And it's, I think that's the future for my organization, for Malaysia, maybe for the world, that um, the leaders and those of us who are maybe above 50 or some of us above 60, uh, you know, we're moving on, but we've got to inspire. And it, we, sometimes we have to write the checks. Sometimes it's just about writing checks, but that we, you know, we, we need to budget for that. It's the young people who are going to drive the change. And that's my last message to the audience out there in Dubai or around the world, drive the change. Thank you. Thank you so much to all our esteemed panelists. It's been a great and insightful discussion and we really appreciate your most valuable input. Um, so this has been the ending of this round table. Kylie, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shanta. I would like to thank all the panelists and moderator, which are Ms. Shanta, Mr. David, Mr. Kenny, Dr. Dennis, Dr. Asmir, Mr. Amajit and Dr. Sulaiman for your sharing. Those were great insights and expertise from all of you. I would also like to thank the Mediterranean Alam Sakita Dan Aye Kasa for providing this opportunity and Veritas Design Group for co-organizing this session with UN Global Compact Network Malaysia and Brunei. This session is now coming to an end and I hope all of you receive all the insightful details you needed. With this, I would like to thank everyone again for attending our session. Stay safe and have a great evening ahead. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.